This time, he invests $550,000 with you, Whitney. Again, he hasn't put a penny more into this policy. It was just the original four hundred grand. But he gets bigger and bigger piles of money. He can do more and more good with that, with his real estate desires and syndication offerings and things that he wants to take advantage of. As he continues to do this, his arbitrage gets bigger and bigger. These policies grow on a more efficient basis every year. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Mark Willis. He's been on the show a few times. We've talked about a number of different things. He's a certified financial planner. So there's a number of things I, I, I'd like to learn from him, right? Uh, as we dive into finances and investing in syndications and what that looks like for his clients. He's, he is an expert in the bank on yourself method. We've talked about that a number of times in the past. He gives a, a brief overview of that today and what that is. But then he, he, we dive in actually into an example. So he shares his screen. You, he talks to it enough where even if you can only listen, you're going to be able to follow what he's talking about. But if you can go to YouTube, and again, I hope you'll like and subscribe and hit the button so it notifies you when we post more shows on there. However, you'll be able to see on there and pause it, of course, so you can see the numbers in the Excel sheet that he is sharing on his screen. He's a co-author of three number one best-selling books. He's the owner of Lake Growth Financial Services, a financial firm in Chicago, Illinois. He's a co-host of Not Your Average Financial Podcast. I know you're going to learn a lot from Mark today. Mark, welcome back to the show. You're a returning guest. I think we've talked a number of times, uh, but I just appreciate your diligence in the financial planning, bank on yourself, you know, uh, all those things that I feel like are important to be educated about, no matter if we're active or passive investors. It's just some good options there uh, that you're bringing to us. So thank you again and welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Whitney. Appreciate it. Yeah, let's jump in. Give us a little update on your focus right now. Is it how's business maybe in your world? What's happening? with Mark and let's jump in. Sure. The world has been a while. I was looking at our notes. The last time I was on, it was Halloween 2022. And so that was a prescient day to be on because as the markets began, I guess the surge upward toward the end of 22 and into 23, we've seen the markets responding well. Now they're off their highs in the last you know week or so, in the last few weeks. But We've had a major market surge since the downturn in 2022, where markets were off 20 or even 30 uh, percent. Now, again, as you're listening to this, it's toward the end of August. If it dropped right when you listen to it, who knows where the markets will be even next week? And that's the problem. Most people I work with are sick and tired of the roller coaster experience, where they put their money into things they cannot access or control. And so one of the strategies that uh, we've become known for across the country in all 50 states is something called Bank on Yourself, which uses a sort of a modernized form of dividend paying whole life insurance as a savings vehicle and as a means of accessing capital for major purchases or investments. So I know we've talked in other episodes about all this, but just for those that may not be familiar, I'll quickly explain. It's a tool that I find to be kind of a central clearinghouse for cash. In my own life and in the lives of our clients, it's essentially a big place to park money in between your deals. So when you put money into a whole life policy, it grows on a guaranteed basis. I'm going to give a 101 for those that don't already know yeah. this. So it grows on a guaranteed basis. The cash value every year on a contractual basis grows guaranteed, no matter what the markets are doing. Second, if we designed it right, there's going to be some significant tax advantages. It might even be available completely tax-free if we do it right. Third, you can certainly use it as a backstop for life insurance. That's what it's there for. So it's obviously going to provide a nice chunk of tax-free money to your family, more than what you've saved for them. And then finally, you can use it like a bank. It's not a bank, of course, but it's a life insurance contract that can be used like a bank to borrow against it for any of your major life milestones, whether it's sending your kid to college, buying a car, or as we might talk about later, investing in a syndication deal. So what can't we use big piles of capital for? That's really why they call it infinite. There's a, a, a specific type and design of these policies that we just refer to as bank on yourself designed. But recently, and to answer your question, as markets have been continuing their vicious cycle, uh, we've seen interest rates rise and in really in the last two years now. And 
as we've found out, that actually is good news for whole life insurance. Whole life insurance will benefit over time from higher mortgage rates, higher bond rates. That's not fun for the markets. It's not fun for real estate deals, but it's great news for those that are holding fixed income style assets like bonds and whatever, if they're holding those funds to maturity, like insurance companies do, that only pours more profitability into the company, which gets then delivered out to the uh, policyholders in the way of a dividend. So to answer your question, we're seeing this idea of bank on yourself, which has been around for over 200 years, really shining right now as this world is going through its gyrations. Speak to, you mentioned it's good news for whole life insurance and fixed income assets. But what are some other examples of fixed income assets? Anybody who's got a coupon payment from a bond, for example, bonds, if you're selling them, can lose money. We saw that in 2002, didn't we? We didn't lose money if you just hold that bond to maturity and then reinvest at the higher rates, which is typically how institutions, endowments, and insurance companies put their money to work. They're not interested in buying and selling. They don't need to buy groceries or, or buy a Disney World for the grandkids like us humans do, like, like us mere mortals. They simply hold the bond to a maturity, whether that's five years, 10 years, or 30 years. And then whatever the open market rate is for the new bonds, which are again going up for the first time in you and I, our lifetime, that now is like additional cash new income. It's like getting a pay raise. If you're an insurance company, it's like getting a pay raise. Now, what they'll do with that coupon payment, again, that might be a mortgage that the insurance company has. It might be rental real estate, hotels, bond, major institutional bonds like investment grade corporate bonds are a big deal. Apple's going to build a new iPhone. They're no doubt going to the bond market. And no doubt insurance companies are going to buy those bonds to help Apple build that iPhone. Then Apple's going to be on the hook to pay the insurance company back for the next 10 years to finance the engineering of this new device we're all going to carry around next year, right? And that's true with Google and the rest of them too. All these major companies uh, are putting their money where their mouth is, and then the insurance companies put their money where their mouth is too. And that's sort of how uh, the insurance company itself puts the money to work and some examples of fixed income. No, that's helpful. I, I just said there's, there's plenty of investors that are listening that are Wanting to think through some of those things, right, that you're talking about. And, and we unfortunately, we don't have time to go in depth in all those things. But I, I do want to get to uh, an example, investor, right? And, it, and I briefly talked about this before we started recording, but I think it's helpful, right, for the listener uh, and myself, all right, to think through maybe an example investor that you have. And I know you are a certified financial planner and would love to hear your thoughts on how you're guiding them, especially if they're investing into syndications and those things. So I don't know, give us an example investor and let's dive in. Sure, no problem. All right, so I will share screen, but I will speak as if folks can't see it and I'll do my very best. So what we're looking at here is an example of a policy. And again, everyone's numbers are gonna be very different. And please realize every policy I design for clients is custom tailored after we've had a full financial analysis, get to know your goals, your objectives, concerns. And every whole life policy is designed differently as well. Uh, so this one is very unique in the way that it's a single premium whole life insurance policy. So this is categorically different than most whole life insurance that folks would have heard about. And what you might be not seeing if you're just listening, driving down the road, is there's a 40-year-old who puts in a large lump sum. In this case, he put in $400,000. Now, he might have had that money sitting in a CD, getting taxed every year in CDs or savings accounts. It might have been a money market account. He could have sold a real estate property. But whatever he had, he had some cash on hand, and he put 400 grand in his case into a life insurance policy. And right away in the very first year, Whitney, you can probably see it too, the cash value should show $379,000. Holy smokes, yes. that's a lot of money. Liquid right away, day one. And the death benefit is $830,000 which is more than double the original contribution this gentleman put into the policy. So right away, day one, if he decides to pass away or graduate on us, as I say, then the, the family would get twice as much money as he would have had the day before. Is this going right. to matter if, if they were, would the death benefit be different if this person was 85 versus 40? 
Yes, correct. It would be less than double. I would think double. so, but I'm Yeah, if you're 85 versus 40, correct. The cash value, on the other hand, would be about the same, roughly speaking, um, unless there's some major health concern that we're not factoring in here. But if you're 65 or 40, essentially the cash value would be about the same. All right, so this is unbelievably high cash value for anybody looking at life insurance regularly. Typically, you're going to have somewhere closer to 60 to 75% of your money in the first year. This has closer to 95% of your money in the first year. So that's an advantage over other forms of whole life insurance. Typically, we cut the commissions out to do it this way to give you a lot more cash. What we give up is complete tax-free growth in the future. This is something called a modified endowment contract. But I'll explain in a minute why that's probably not a problem for folks because we use several strategies to avoid that tax. But let's get into what the the growth of this policy would look like. Now, first, I really just want to say by year eight, just keep that number in mind, Whitney, what you're seeing, guys who can't see it. The cash value has grown from $379,000. And in year three, it's already up to four hundred and fifteen grand, more than the guy put in there just by year three. And by year eight, it's already up to $520,000. Now realize this is money that's growing predictably, even with guarantees. It's liquid and available. So that's so what, if this what, individual did nothing. But correct, yeah. If he never touches this money, it's just going to grow in the account for the rest of his life on a predictable basis. But it's not locked up, is it? You have access to the money in this account. What could we be doing with this money? Whitney, can you think of any projects or programs or syndications or, whoops, I spilled the beans there. Anything that you might <laughs> think this guy could use. Of course, use? right, right. Yeah. <laughs> if we want to be able to invest it passively, right, into other deals. And yeah, mm -hmm. tell us how to do that. Let's say he does that. So here's the exact same policy, but this time he takes a loan in the very first year for $360,000. Maybe he puts that with one of your opportunities that you uh, are working on with clients all around the country. Any exciting ones that you want to quickly plug or mention, Whitney? Yeah, I appreciate that. Point? We do have a portfolio in Kansas City. It's about full though. So if anybody's interested, they can definitely go to the website and sign up, but you'd have to do it pretty quick. All right. And the next one is forthcoming. I assume that will be there will be other programs and projects and syndications coming. And that's no the point. There's always money and opportunity always finds itself uh, reaching for people who can take advantage of the opportunity. Who can take advantage? It's the people sitting on piles of cash, especially if we're going into a, a downturn economically. Banks are going to be less happy to lend. HELOCs are being limited, or at least the rates are going up. But this guy has a pool of money he can access for any reason at any time. And so he does. In the very first year, he takes a loan for $360,000 and then repays that loan over the eight-year period that syndication was in a cycle. So maybe the syndication finishes up in five years, but I had to go all of eight years there. So hopefully most syndications are done by then. Over that same eight-year period, remember the cash value went from 379 grand to 520 grand. Okay, he put in 400,000, it grew to 520. Whitney, that's an increase of 120,000 bucks. Not bad. But the really cool piece to this is it will continue to grow at the exact same rate whether you borrow from this policy or not. So when he borrowed the 360 grand to go invest with you or your multifamily deals, the policy was going to continue to grow and compound even on that capital he borrowed to invest with you. Now, whatever you can get him with your syndication is not even factored into this spreadsheet. What we're looking at here is he got $120,000 of growth over eight years. Now, to borrow from a life insurance policy, they do charge loan interest. And you can see it here. There's a loan interest paid of $54,000 over eight years. And that works out to a 2.1% annual percentage rate for those that really want to know. So let's just kind of summarize this and I'll hush and give, give the ball back to you, Whitney. What happened here? He had 400 grand. He could have given it to Whitney and Whitney, you would have done a great job with it. But this guy instead decided to put that money into a policy and then borrow out 360,000 to invest with Whitney. That grows over the course of the years from 379 grand to 520. That's an increase from what he put in of 120 grand. Now he did pay some loan interest, 54 grand for the privilege of doing that. But even so, his arbitrage was 65,900 bucks. 
That's 65 grand earnings above and beyond what he paid in interest. That's a great deal. Not to mention whatever he could do with the syndication that we're not even factoring in here. So Whitney, any feedback, insights, thoughts? on? Yeah, no, I was just thinking through that. I know two things that come to mind, or there's a number of things we could talk about, but obviously it continuing to grow when you have the money out of it, or like you've taken the money, this loan out, how does it continue to grow? Well, you want the short answer? I'll start with that and then we can go deeper. If yeah, you, want. you better give us the short answer, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, that's fine. <laughs> well, there's deeper dives into this, as you probably can imagine. But in essence, the insurance company does not recognize that you took that loan. In fact, you're using your cash value merely as collateral for the loan that you got from the insurance company. So your cash value is still there. It's not been touched or affected. When you take a loan, they simply use your cash value as collateral and they give you a loan from the general account to the insurance company. That's how they simply don't recognize that you take a loan. One quick note on this, many insurance companies who claim to do what we're talking about here uh, do recognize that you take a loan. A great mutually owned company, let's just say from the Northwest, I won't mention any names, does recognize when you borrow from those policies. And they will penalize you, in essence, for borrowing your own cash, which I think is a non-starter. So some good questions to ask if you're starting to do this or yeah, thinking about this. What about the the term guaranteed, right? I mean, everybody says, hey, run if somebody says guaranteed, right? That's but right. But you mentioned that earlier as far as a guaranteed return. How is it guaranteed? guaranteed? Well, that's an, another deep dive answer, but I'll give you the short and we can go deeper if you want on another podcast. It's a contract. It's a contract. This you're you deal in contracts all the time. And what is the benefit of a guarantee written into the contract? It's only as good as the insurance company that's backing that guarantee. I mean, it, it goes back to that old Tommy Boy reference. I won't go into the full movie quote, but I think most folks will know what I'm talking about. Guarantee is only as good as the guy who can back that guarantee. So what are the insurance companies claiming? They're claiming that you're going to guarantee by a guaranteed rate, having more money in your account every single year. And there's really nothing we can do to stop it. No markets can take it away. The insurance company itself is on the hook for that guarantee. And you're getting what's called a unilateral contract from them to you, where they really can't wiggle out of that promise. Once once they approve you for the underwriting and, and you start your policy, that guarantee happens for the rest of your life. How is that possible? The insurance company has your death benefit in case you died this afternoon, in case I died yesterday. So if I don't pass away, that's my goal, by the way then the insurance company has my death benefit ready to go and they'll give me a little bit more of it in the way of cash value uh, to say, hey, Mark, congratulations, making it another year. If you walk away from this contract, we'll give you your cash value increased by 10 grand or 12 grand or whatever you get this year. So that now that you're a year older, we'd like to pay you this cash value rather than your full death benefit as a means of just saying, hey, nice to work with you. Please cancel this contract. That's essentially what the insurance company is saying when they guarantee you an increase of your cash. I don't want to cancel the contract. So the longer I keep that contract in force, the more and higher cash values I get to accumulate. So it's sort of like a game of chicken between me and the insurance company. As long as I live, I'm holding on to my policies and they can keep giving us those guarantees. Those funds, though, I know I've been asked this before. It's like, well, are the funds really mine then, right? Obviously, or are my giving them to the insurance company and ultimately it's their greenbacks then, right? I, I can't ever, you know, I can't get them back in my account. I, I've heard that or, or I've heard people ask about that. I don't know, just elaborate on that just a little bit. Yeah, great question. Well, it, it's no more yours than any of the real estate you have a contract on. Those are yours, right? What What proof do you have that you own any real estate? Typically, it's the contract you hold. If you don't have a contract, all we have is squatter's rights for our real estate, right? And who's got the bigger shotgun? And so it's true with life insurance too. Life insurance, annuities, and real estate are really the three big contractual wealth assets. And I believe in contractual wealth. I don't believe in paper wealth that you get on Wall Street that goes up, goes down. That's paper wealth. But contractual wealth, the sort of stuff that really is the bedrock of civilization, is really what I'm concerned about when I work with clients. I want their wealth to be primarily in contracts Again, real estate, annuities, insurance, 
There's other forms of contractual wealth out there, but that is what really holds them to the fact that this is your money. In fact, it's more money. It's more your money than the bank account you have because where's your contract with your bank? If the bank goes bankrupt, what recourse do we really have? I mean, is really, I mean, FDIC, is that really what we're going to rely on? Our, our financial future is going to be relying on FDIC. That's so, right there. Yeah, yeah. So I'd much rather have my real money under my control in a company that I own, a mutual life insurance company is one that you and I own together and put that money into a contract instead. Yeah. Was there a final number there that you were going to share with us? Like this is how much growth or over a certain amount of time? I don't know. I do want meant to get, Oh, with, with this guy's there. example here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I, I'll share my screen really quick here and I'll just get pun get to the punchline. This guy doesn't ever stop his policy and over the rest of his lifetime, it just grows. And so as you can see, going down the page, he keeps doing more and more syndications deals. And, and by year 10, he does another loan. This time he invests $550,000 with you, Whitney. Again, he hasn't put a penny more into this policy. It was just the original 400 grand, but he gets bigger and bigger piles of money. He can do more and more good with that, with his real estate desires and syndication offerings and things that he wants to take advantage of. As he continues to do this, his arbitrage gets bigger and bigger. These policies grow on a more efficient basis every year with those guarantees and also the dividends on top of the guarantees. So his second round, he does another eight-year loan, this time for 550 grand, pays it back, same, generally the same annual percentage rate of about, in this case, 1.9%. But his growth was $191,000 over eight years. Remember the first time around, Whitney, it was only 120000 so these policies just get more and more efficient with bigger and bigger dollars as the years go on. And yes, he paid some loan interest, again, 74 grand in that case, but his net positive arbitrage was 116,000 bucks. How many times can we do this is the question that clients keep asking me. Mark, how many times can I run the money through my policies before I go invest in another triplex or a syndication deal or whatnot? So if I put half a million dollars in, for for example, I could split that up over, say, $500,000 loans or investment, depending on the cash value, of course. But there's no limit to how we split that up or how we invest that, it sounds like. And yeah, it sounds like it would be a, a good deal for, for an insurance policy, for sure, for your family or, yeah. I don't know. I have still not pulled the trigger on something like this, Mark, but you and I have talked about it a number of times. but. I personally have still not done it. Interesting though, any, anything else about that method specifically or this example you want to point out before we move to a final couple of questions? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd say mainly it's the opportunity to pull that trigger for this guy. Yeah. With, let's imagine a world where banks weren't going to be really excited to lend out a bunch of money to people. And he finds a great deal. Maybe it's a real estate deal. Maybe it's a syndication opportunity. And no other investors are getting in. He'd get the preferred rate or he'd get that great real estate deal that when no one else is on the courthouse steps, but he can bring money out of a policy within three to five business days. No banker can re deny him his money. This only gives you more options, not less, to have money sitting in a liquid contingency or opportunity fund like this. Uh, so over time, I'd say this will become, hopefully, my hope and, and dream and mission is to see at least 10% of America doing this. I mean, if we could just get 10% of America doing these policies, we could end the Fed. We could uh, get rid of credit card debts. We could get rid of a lot of stuff that troubles people today, like these funky interest rates and more. And then we could bring banking back down to the you and me level, Whitney. Wouldn't that be cool? That we would wouldn't be have cool. to beg some banker, kiss the ring of the banker. We'd be in control of our finances once again. Yeah. Wow. No, it's incredible. I love the mission. And yeah, bringing that back in our hands as far as how we get debt and being able to use it for that. All right, Mark, unfortunately, we got to move to a few final questions. And But you know, what's a way you've recently improved your business? It's continually bringing people who are smarter than me into the mix and then finding a way to fire myself. I've never been better at firing myself. There's an old quote, if you don't know how to start the lawnmower, you don't have to cut the grass. So hire well. Put them on the right seats on the bus and uh, then carry on. Hmm. Yeah, that's very wise. Who, not how, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's your, your best source for meeting new clients right now? We're having a lot of fun having conversations with 
wealth groups, investment groups. Uh, going on podcasts is one and going to a membership sites that uh, are like mastermind groups that are learning counterintuitive ways to build wealth. So that's been a lot of fun doing summits, just traveled. I was just out of Tennessee, actually, just a week or two ago with a group of business owners. And it's a lot of fun when you can meet in person as opposed to all, only virtual. What's your best advice for passive investors right now? Maybe outside of the bank on yourself method. Well. I'd say a bad deal doesn't become a good deal just because rates are low. I think we all learned that in the last year or two. So make sure that you do your math and that you like the person, like Whitney. Make sure you like Whitney, uh, like I do. But before you put your money uh, in anything, make sure you know the person behind the deal, not just the the numbers on a spreadsheet. For sure. No doubt about it. Uh, what about, what's the biggest challenge you're facing right now in your business? Given all of the, all the economic world that we're living in, it's actually incredibly hard to take on. I've only been able to take a limited number of clients each month as things have really been really exploding around here. So we've been training and bringing on additional advisors and associates that do what I do. And we thankfully have 200 bank on yourself professionals that I'm connected to all across the United States and Canada. But it's still not enough. We probably need, if we're going to get to 10% of, of, of the population, we need more like 10,000 bank on yourself professionals. So we're in ramp up hiring mode uh, as fast as we can with uh, training and quality. What are some of the most important metrics that you track? Could be personally or professionally. Oh, well, like weight, like my waist circumference. That's one. <laughs> I'm checking that uh, at least once a week. I'm checking that out, trying to keep myself in the right zones for health and longevity. Got to be around to see my great grandkids. On a business level, I think really it's just the numbers of people we're working with and the satisfaction of seeing five-star reviews has been a lot of fun from our clients. So we track that. And every time when we meet with our staff, we do a good news round, just what's happening that's good news because uh, you can get bogged down in the bad news. Yeah, no, I love that. What about uh, habits that you are disciplined about, Mark? Well, every morning I've got a little routine that I follow and I really try my best to say positive things out of my mouth first thing in the morning. So I've got a little sh kind of a memorized sheet of, of sayings, affirmations, prayers that I say as a way of starting the day, not with curses, but with blessings. I want those things to be from the lips of my mouth. I want those things to be good first thing because the rest of the day hopefully follows what you do at the beginning. What about how do you like to give back? Given the amount of work we're doing with training others, it's been so cool to watch advisors' lives changed as we train them. So given the training volume that we're doing right now, it's been a lot of fun to give time and energy and attention and money to helping our advisors become successful. And then we've got a number of different nonprofits and you know, considerable charitable work that my wife and I do uh, around the area here and around the country. So, but watching the lives change of those advisors is unbelievable. It changed my family tree whenever I became a financial planner. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. So this has been world-changing, life-changing experience for me as well. Awesome. Mark, I'm grateful for you giving back to us today. I love examples and appreciate you taking the time to share your screen, and even show us a, 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 an example where we can see the numbers. I would encourage the listeners to go to YouTube where you can even pause it, right? And, and look at that, what Mark shared. Uh, but also hope you'll reach out to him. I know he has a, a virtual summit coming up that he's hosting, uh, I think a week or so after this will publish. Uh, either way, I hope you'll, you'll go and sign up with Mark. Mark, where should they do that? Where can they find you? Yeah, this is an, a chance to meet me, but also a number of other major uh, speakers. We've got uh, a nationally recognized uh, economist and former presidential candidate, Lawrence Kotlikoff, who's going to be speaking. We've got a gentleman named Len Rainier, who's the founder of Wealth and Wisdom, written multiple books, many of them New York Times bestselling books, both uh, Larry and Len. We also have a number of industry titans. If you want to meet some of the presidents and vi vice presidents of these major insurance companies that represent this bank on yourself strategy and ask them questions directly, they'll be there. And I'll be there. A number of our associates will be there speaking as well. You can go to notyouraveragefinancialsummit.com. That's notyouraveragefinancialsummit.com. And you can register there. we got just basically one more week. It starts on September 6th and 7th. And it's a half-day event, both days. So from 
from 12.30 p.m. Central Time to 4.30 p.m. Central Time on September 6th and 7th. Guys can go check that out at notyouraveragefinancialsummit.com. And if you want to chat with me or set up a time to speak with me to learn more about this strategy, if you're listening to this after September 7th, 2023, then go to kickstartwithmark.com. That's the best site for you to reach out to me and my team. That's kickstartwithmark.com. Awesome. I, Mark, thank you so much. I want the listeners to know, hey, when I try this method, I'm going to reach out to Mark. He's going to be my first call. So, so I just, I want you to check him out. So you can go to this summit. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. Thanks so much for having me on, Whitney. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.